Good morning, everyone. So happy to have uh, live and in-person people, and we're happy to have people joining us on, online on Facebook and on YouTube. And so thanks for joining us today. We're uh, uh, excited to study the Word this morning, and uh, praise the Lord for a busy week. So it just depends if you, if you look at your Sunday as the beginning of the week or the end of the week. If it's the end of the week, praise the Lord, that week's done. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's the beginning, we're starting afresh. Praise the Lord. It's a, it's a brand new day. And the Lord's mercies are renewed every day. And we, we are so thankful for that. We are so thankful for the mercy of the Lord and his goodness. And just think how much you want to know him. He wants to know you even more. He wants to know you. And I feel like that too many people have a... Uh, have a view that is a harsh, harsh, judgmental God rather than a God with his arms spread open wide saying, come unto me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. And so that's what I view God as, a very loving heavenly father who loves us all. The word says he's not willing that any should perish, and he wants all to come to him. And so as, as I was uh, thinking about... <clears throat> Earlier in the week, I'd, I'd look this up because of, I feel like that, uh, well, I'll read it first, and this is what it says. How about, how about if I frame it this way? Did you know that the Bible says this? Forgiveness comes through repentance. Forgiveness comes through repentance. And so real quick, we'll start off with this because there's five verses here. Here's five relevant verses and the first one is, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Luke 3.3, 3. and he came into all the district around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 3.19, Therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Praise the Lord. I tell you what, you can just, just reading that verse is refreshing. <laughs> just reading that verse and thinking about all that it implies brings refreshment. It's so good, I'll, I'll read, it, read it one more time. Acts 3.19, just in case you want to write it down. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Wow, that's what our nation needs right there, right there in black and white. And so that's one of the reasons I'm reading these five verses, just so you'll know they're in the Bible, because uh, some people have start, stopped preaching this. There's some, there's some churches, you, you wouldn't hear the word repentance. You're not hearing that, that word. They just omit it. I don't know why. Well, there's a, well, maybe they need to repent. <laughs> Good word, Faye. Faye's preaching today. Come on up, Faye. <laughs> okay, now then the last one was Acts 5.31. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. Praise the Lord. That's what I'm saying. We have a loving heavenly father who sent his only son so that we could have the opportunity to repent of our sins and to, to, to experience the fullness of forgiveness, to realize I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, and I'm free. I'm forgiven, and because I'm forgiven, I can be free from that load of guilt and sin and the past. I can be free from the past. And so that is a, a real key that there's so many people in our generation that still need to hear this message. Because as children and as young people, we, we heard this message a lot. We heard the message of repentance, of repent, and then you will be forgiven. 
And so we want to, uh, we don't want to change the gospel. And so we want to get that message out that repentance and forgiveness are still available. They're still available and it still works. It works to bring freedom in your life, to bring freedom from the past, to bring freedom from, from overwhelming burdens of life. And so I just want to encourage you today. And as you look it up, as I was looking it up earlier this week, I found uh, 12 more. <laughs> There's 12 more scriptures in there that talk just about that repentance and forgiveness. And so, wow, what a message. What a message. It's all through the word. And if we will seek him, we'll find him. That's in the word, too. If we will be seeking for God, if we begin to seek him with all of our heart, then we will find him. And so I want to encourage you to be one of those, one of those men, one of those women that seek God, that seek after him, that want to know him more. And as we pursue him, then we find that, that blessing that comes from being filled with the Holy Spirit, that, be, that comes from being filled with forgiveness of sins, forgiveness of our trespasses. And it causes us, It'll cause a love revelation in your life. When you receive a revelation of how much the Heavenly Father loves you, it will transform and change your life completely and totally. So praise the Lord. We're so happy to have everyone joining us today. And we are in 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now, how many of you know that uh, culture affects us. It affects the lenses that we see through. Anybody remember that uh, old country song, Rose-Colored Glasses? <laughs> Those rose-colored glasses that you've been looking through. We won't get into that, but it just <laughs> makes the point that, you know, it's, it's a known fact that our culture, the things that are around us, the people that are around us affect our viewpoint. And culturally today, there's so many things that make an impact on us. But as Christians and as the church, we need to be living a overcoming, supernatural, spirit-filled Christian life so that we can begin to impact culture. And so, listen, I know there are challenges even in that. There are challenges when we, when we set our mind to that and say, I'm going to live for God and I'm going to make an impact on my world. When we, when we determine that, listen, there's, there's an opposition that will come against us, that will fight against us. And the same thing was, was true of Paul. You know, in the, uh, in the Old Testament, I mean, in the New Testament, Paul, at the beginning, he was persecuting the church. But as Michelle mentioned last week, you know, one encounter with Jesus Christ. One encounter with the true living Christ, the resurrected, supernatural, powerful Christ transformed Paul's entire life. It changed him totally and completely, radically. It changed him radically because before that, he saw the world one way. It was through the lens of his, the way he had been brought up. It was through the lens of the things that he was pursuing, and he was doing his best. He thought he was serving God, but after he had this revelation of Christ, his eyes were opened. Matter of fact, it was so brilliant, he was blinded. He was blinded by the light of Christ. He was blinded, and it transformed and changed him when he went and was prayed for, and his sight was restored when he began to see again. He saw a whole new picture, a whole new revelation and understanding of life. And he had a brand new calling. It was a calling to bring the gospel, the gates, that same gospel message of repent for your sins and be saved and transformed. He was that became his calling to take that message to the Gentiles. And so. Here in um, 1 Timothy 2, we know that even after, even after uh, uh, his, his transformation, even after his uh, 
uh, supernatural experience with Christ, he was still affected by culture because you can see it even through the things that, that he wrote. And so in this chapter, we're going to get into some things, especially in the, in the second portion of it. We're going to get into some things where it says the, uh, the, the topic of it is the conduct of women. <laughs> and so I looked at multiple translations on that. And I was, I was uh, looking at that and I was thinking, yeah, Paul was still affected by culture. <laughs> he was affected by the times that he lived in. And you know that we're affected by the times we live in. And so as we look through, as we look at this, and as we gain an understanding of it, uh, I feel like it's so important for us to, to put on our lenses of, Lord, show me what this scripture that I want to know the actual full meaning of it. And so we've got a couple of uh, topics that we're going to look at before we get to that. But starting in verse 9, we're going to talk about, well, the, the scriptural uh, portion there says the conduct of women, but I think there's some other topics on, along. But what I'm saying is we want to uh, study that and look at the relevance of it in light of the day in which we're alive and what the what's uh, what's known and so we're going to we're going to examine that but the first portion the first portion is so relevant to us today because it's talking about prayer so the first half of the chapter is talking specifically about prayer and so that's where we're going to start this morning and um, so I've chosen on your notes it's in the passion translation and so I felt like that when we especially on that second portion the passion the message, some of the newer translations really brought out some real clarification, on, as, especially on the second half of the chapter. But, um, you know, we, we have come so far as far as in, in our real understanding of this. And so anyway, let's, let's go ahead and, and just start with it. But we're going to be reading from the Passion Translation initially here, and um, then we're going to examine some of the uh, prayer points and see if it can enhance our prayer life and the way that we pray, especially in light of what we're dealing with today in our government. So let's look at this. First Timothy chapter 2 says, Most of all, I'm writing to encourage you, he's writing to Timothy, to encourage you to pray with a gratitude to God. Pray for all men with all forms of prayers and requests as you intercede with intense passion and pray for every political leader and representative so that we would be able to live tranquil, undisturbed lives as we worship the awe-inspiring God with pure hearts. It is pleasing to our God, to our Savior God, to pray for them. He longs for everyone to embrace his life and return to the full knowledge of truth. So we know that about God. He's not willing that any should perish. And so the instruction here is to pray for everyone. We're to pray for everyone, that they would repent, that they would receive forgiveness, that they would know God and know the fullness. And so verse 5, For God is one, and there is one mediator between God and the sons of men, the true man, Jesus the anointed one. He gave himself as ransom payment for everyone. Now is the proper time for God to give the world this witness. I have been divinely called as an apostle to preach this revelation, which is the truth. God has called me to be a trustworthy teacher to the nations. Therefore, I encourage the men to pray on every occasion with hands lifted to God in worship with clean hearts and free from frustration and strife. So as I mentioned, this chapter is really broken up into two parts, and this, this first portion is broken up into two parts. So we're going to begin with the, uh, with the first, with his instruction specifically about prayer. Now, all of you are aware of the political uh, times in which we're living, the political nature of the government that we're currently serving under and living under. And uh, if you listen to, if you continue to listen to the prophets, uh, I have heard our current uh, man filling the White House. <laughs> One of my favorite uh, 
prophetic guys that I've been listening to, I mean, he, he makes no bones about it. He basically, and he comes right out and calls uh, Biden a jackal and says that he's, he's, he's filling that position, but he has stolen that position, and so he doesn't have the rights to the, to the uh, normal awe and respect that we would even give the office. And so, as I've been listening to him, he's been praying and uh, seeking God, and he's said, basically, that that is what God has said about him and that he's filling that office, but not for long. And so we, as following after God, we're pursuing God. We're pursuing God with all of our heart. We want to hear what God has to say. And so as I've been praying, I've been praying, Lord, bring justice, bring exposure, bring restoration to that office, because we want that to be an honorable office, as well as the other offices of those that are in uh, authority in Washington, those who are in the Senate, those who are in the House. So we, we've continued to pray for these people, although it's very difficult to honor them as leaders when you can look at them and see that they're not telling the truth, that they're spreading lies, and they come with an agenda which is a destructive agenda toward this nation. And so we continue to pray, Lord, take them out of that office. If they've obtained that office by wrong means, by cheating, by lying, by deception, then remove them. Lord, remove them from that office and give it to another who is better than them. And so we pray, and so we, we are going to use wisdom as we pray. We use the word, and we also, we accept rhema word. So if we hear the prophets speaking a word that from the Lord, then we're to judge that word. And there are those that we can, you know, when we come into agreement with that word, Lord, I hear what your prophet is saying, and I, I'm weighing that out in the balance of the word of God, and I'm seeing, Lord, what, what this word says. And so, Lord, I agree with that word. Or if we, if we can't come into agreement with it on the face of it and hearing it, then we say, Lord, give me wisdom concerning this word. Lord, open my eyes. Give me revelation because the same Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that raised up Christ from the dead that is given to all men now indwells within us. And that same Spirit, there's one God, and that God's in agreement. The God of the heavenlies, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune Godhead, are in agreement. And so we need to pray, Lord, I need your wisdom. I need your guidance. In the meantime, I'm going by your word. This is to pray for all men everywhere. And so I'm going to pray for those that are in authority. If they're in that authority by ill repute, by false pretense, then I pray, Lord, you remove them. Lord, cause the circumstances to come around that they are removed from that office and cast out and place another in that office. And so there are those in our government today that are working against this nation. And I've heard many even in this last week, you can, it's, it's becoming more and more clear because I, I heard even this week Ted Cruz was talking and he said, he said, this is what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going to call for a resolution, and we're going to bring it to a vote. We're going to bring it to a vote next week because we want to see who's for Israel and who's not. Who's going to show their cards and say, I'm for Israel. I'm for our ally, and we want to be friends with Israel. We choose, especially as a Christian people, we support Israel, and we want to be for them, and so we pray for them. But we also want to support them with our votes. And so we want to know in black and white who is in Washington that's going to stand for Israel. Who is in Washington that's going to, to vote to support Israel with our money and our support. And so we pray. And so it is definitely a, a, continue, a time where we need to continue to battle spiritually, to pray 
in a supernatural way. Lord, give me insight. Give me wisdom. Open my understanding and let me hear what your what heaven is saying, because I want to be in agreement with what heaven is saying. I want to be in agreement with what the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are saying. And so I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for these for the state leaders. And so so we need to start. You know, we need to pray in the in the in our region. So we're going to pray for Houston. We're going to pray for Texas, and we're going to pray for this nation. And we're going to pray for God's will to be done. We're going to pray according to the, the Lord's prayer. We're going to pray according to the word. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And pray, Lord, I want to pray in agreement with your Holy Spirit, with agreement with your word, and I want to come in, in full and complete honor of your word. And so the way that we do that is by putting it into action and by daily praying and we have to we have to look around we have to be vigilant we have to be vigilant and pray with our eyes open and looking and seeing and say what are these politicians saying what are they saying with their mouth and what are they saying with their votes what are they saying with their actions and are they supporting israel are they supporting causes that we can get behind praise the lord we have a governor who signed a great bill into into law just this week that we can all get in agreement with. When there is a heartbeat, there is a baby, and we're going to save that baby. We're going to save lives, and that's going to save thousands and thousands of baby lives. And I'd heard, I think there were 18 other states that were looking to see what happened in Texas. And so we're praying, Lord, let that, let that just pass across this nation and let people begin to stand for life because we're for life. We are for, we are for saving lives and delivering lives and seeing people raised up for the kingdom. Amen. Amen. I, I heard a testimony this week of an uh, older man in the ministry, and he was talking about that uh, when he was young in the ministry, <clears throat> that a visiting minister had come to his church, and that visiting minister had a little kid running around over there. And he said, oh, you know, that's this little kid running around over there. So he was so excited because the minister was there. But you know that that little kid that was running around over there around the altars grew up, went to Bible school, served in different ministry positions, and now has a leadership position in this guy's fellowship. And he said, how in the world would I have even anticipated that that little kid running around over there by the altar was going to be the leader of this whole organization? <laughs> How in the world? Wow. Isn't that supernatural? And so when we're down here praying for the Josiah generation every week, we need to pray, Lord, fill them with the Holy Spirit. Lord, give them wisdom. Give them a love for your word. Give them a love for worship. Let them be young people that love to worship. Let them be young people that fall in love with your word and love your word and want to honor your word with their life and with their, with their future and submit themselves to your word. And then, Lord, you raise them up and put them in a position where they can be effective for the kingdom. And so one of the things that we had uh, talked about this last week, so uh, uh, in our prayer, in our prayer, because I specifically asked Michelle, let's see if I kept this list. Yeah, I kept it. Praise the Lord. <laughs> because I uh, asked Michelle, I said, oh, we need to get that list. Because, I mean, literally for the last, I would say, 15 years, we've been hearing about this. You know, the, the, the original book, it was based on the Seven Mountain Prophecy. And... Uh, the seven mountains of societal influence. And we started hearing this, like I said, 10, 15 years ago, rumblings about this and, and a strategy starting to emerge. And, it, it, and it, when, as I was reading it, it came from a prayer ministry and it was beginning to emerge that we as the church for way too long, let me tell you, way too long have, we, we've just given over these other mountains of influence to the world. And I'd heard a, a message this, uh, I think it was last week, it was a week ago, 
but where Johnny Enlow was talking specifically about that and saying that we just, we just, you know, in the church, too many in the church got the rapture mentality as, oh, Jesus is coming back. We don't have to worry about this world or what's going on in it. We, you know, they just, you know, we'll just get our eyes on Jesus and, you know, we're not going to worry about anything else. And in the meantime, we allowed evil men to fill the positions of leadership in all of these seven mountains of influence. And so that's why media has been taken over and deceived and led astray. And so that they're, instead of reporting the news, they're preaching the news. They're preaching their version of the news in media. And they have been very effective because how else would you turn on one channel and you hear one thing? You turn the next channel, exact same thing. You turn the next channel, exact same wording. They're reading from the same script. They have the same playbook, and they've been a very effective at putting their deceptive people in those positions. And so we in the church, we have to use wisdom. We have to use uh, the spirit that is upon us to become strong and strong-minded we have to become strong in our mind, in our mental makeup, that we are going to stand in this hour, in this culture. We're going to stand by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to preach the gospel. We're going to teach what the Word says, and we're going to go into these seven mountains of influence. Although there's giants in the land, guess what? There's giants in the land, but we're strong in the Lord. We are strong in the church, and we have to go into those mountains of influence and slay those giants so that we can take those positions of influence because I'm saying spiritually we have to become fierce we have to become fierce and begin to move into those areas how did Donald Trump rise to the top of the business world because he was fierce he was fierce in business he said I'm going to rise to the top in the business world yeah, he had a leg up because his dad helped him get a leg up. But, you know, he made fortunes and lost fortunes. Then he made the fortune again, and he lost a fortune again. Then he made another fortune. And then he, he's risen up, and he was at the top of his game when he decided to go into politics. And, you know, he took it by storm and rose to the highest place in the land. And people didn't like the way that he tweeted or they didn't like the way that he talked. Well, it's because he's fierce, and he was a businessman, and he rose to the top of the business world. Then he rose to the top of the political world, and he was doing good for America. He was doing good for Americans and putting America first. And so I'm not trying to make this a political teaching this morning. We're just saying that as Christians, we need to be fierce in this hour in this time and have a strong mental makeup and we can't melt and willow at the first sign of opposition. As a Christian, we have to be strong in the Lord and stand upon this word and be and have a realization that this message, the the, the message that we came into the world, that, that we came into the, the kingdom with, the gospel of repentance. For the forgiveness of sins, it still works to transform people's lives, and it will work in every arena, and we can stand in those arenas with our head held high, and we can begin to be men and women of influence, and we begin to not only affect the mountain of religion, but family. We've got to be men and women of integrity, and we have to, you know, put aside the petty squabbles that have caused the nation's divorce rate to skyrocket. Skyrocket. It's crazy. It is ridiculous, this, the, the divorce rate in this nation. And I say that as a man who's been divorced, okay? And it's ridiculous because there's so many people that get divorced over petty things because they begin to get their eyes and say, they say, I want to do this. I want to do this, you know, and, and it becomes all about I. Yes, Linda. And that's, that's a cultural phenomenon that we're seeing now, that we're seeing now is that a lot of young people aren't even getting married. They're not even getting married. But 
marriage, you'll hear just about at every, every wedding, just about, marriage is an institution ordained by God. He's put his blessing upon it. We still need to be, have people that are married for life, married and committed to one another and committed to Jesus first, committed to each other as individuals and committed to the kingdom. And so we have to take back this mountain of family. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the, with the author, Bob Woodson. Bob Woodson. He's a little, he's a little you know, so, sometimes I think uh, when you, he's not a real big man. Not real, uh, but real imposing. Even listening to his voice. He was on, I think it was Jesse Waters where I saw him. But I've seen him before on several shows. But he's written a new book. He's written a new book that really tells the truth about race. It tells the truth about race. And he said that in the, uh, I think it was between 1920 and 1940, that uh, it was in the, in the time where Booker T. Washington and had, had gone together and worked with, I think it was Coca-Cola, but I can't remember the name of the, no, it was Sears. The head of Sears and Booker T. Washington <clears throat> got together, and they both put in $4 million, or, and, and then it seemed like another one came together, and they put in $4.8 million. And they, they uh, opened all of these institutions across the nation serving black families. And they, they said at that time there was a gap of, I think, three years, three years and six months or something like that in the level of education for white students and black students. There was a gap. He said, and they went to work. They opened these institutions. And so it was Sears, which was a, at the time a major corporation in the United States, and Booker T. Washington, who was a very successful uh, black man and businessman and entrepreneur and they put these institutions together he said and in that 20 year period they brought they closed that gap to 6 months he said then at that in the 1940s there was only a 6 month gap in level of education but they had all of these other tremendous tremendous accomplishments and he said one of the other things i think it was in the 1920s that he said, in black culture, said they loved God, they honored God, and their rate of marriage was like 97%. And that they were raising Christian families. And, but he was talking about the dangers of putting government in charge, of allowing government to be in charge. He said, and what they had, they had actually disenfranchised the poor because. They put the government in charge of the poor and saw it as an opportunity. He said, and so what happened was a lot of the money that was going to the poor wasn't going to the poor. It was going to these people who were in charge of the money, and they were misusing it, and they were seeing it as an opportunity for themselves rather than an opportunity to serve the people. And so we've seen that happen over and over and over again. That's brought us to these days. But I was so happy to see here was a man that was... And, and he has his own institution, the Woodson, in, I think it's institution, but he produced this book. It's a, a group of essays, and I was thinking, man, so many people in this nation need to read that book and get the truth. Amen. I'm sorry. I got it sidetracked there. Um, but anyway, we need to take these mountains back. We've got to take these mountains back of education Education, oh my goodness, there's 13 states right now, 13 states that have come against this, this uh, project that is trying to infiltrate our education system and mislead so many millions of people. So we need more states to stand up and say, we're gonna, pre we're gonna teach the truth in our education. We're not going to begin to indoctrinate these, these children with, with racism. I mean, that's what it is. It is complete racism. And so uh, the, the, we mentioned the mountain of media. So the others, arts and entertainment and business. And so we as Christians, we have got to get fierce in our, in our stand for the kingdom. And we have to go and take these mountains for the kingdom. We need, we need Christian entrepreneurs, businessmen 
who will become strong and become wealthy and use their wealth for the kingdom, use, continue to use their wealth. And do you know that that, has, that is really how the United States of America has been responsible for evangelizing the world and for the most part. We have, we have sent missionaries in every part of the world. Yeah, there's other countries who have done that as well. But the United States of America through from the 40s through modern times has sent missionaries around the world. Now, I've heard more recently that now there are other countries that have been so come to the place. And so they're beginning to send out evangelists now. They're from Australia, from the U.K., from other nations and I know that, you know, uh, there's plenty of other nations that have participated. But I do know that, you know, in the uh, following years following World War II, that the United States sent out more missionaries and more money and more wealth to evangelize this world than anyone else. And so I just want to encourage you that we, this is something we have to do once again. We have to take this, we have to get a mindset of strength. A mindset of strength. And so, um, where it's talking about, I, I want us to continue to, to bring those seven mountains into our, into our prayer on Wednesday nights that we, will, that we will formally be praying, Lord, raise up these young people. Raise up this generation to believe in you so strong to have a supernatural strength and ability from God that we're not just raising up leaders for the church. Yes, we want to do that. We want to do that. But we need to raise up leaders in all of these other mountains that will go and be Christian men and women, Christian politicians, Christian media, Christian businessmen, we need strong spiritual leaders. And we, you know, it has to be formed on the foundation of the family. And so that's why we need to raise up strong Christian families. So anyway, as we're praying, I want you to begin to pray into those specific areas and pray that we'll begin to see these mountains taken back for the kingdom. And with the worldwide revival that we're anticipating coming, we're going, we are, we are believing we are going to see it. We're going to see it with our eyes that Christians raise up, rise up, rise up to the top of the culture and begin to implement the kingdom mentality and kingdom structure into all of these other mountains. So, as I was mentioning, we want to go over just real quickly now these, uh, what, what it talks about these these five attitudes or six attitudes in prayer. Number one, where it says the word supplication is a translation of the Greek word desis, which is described the attitude of one who beseeches a king. And so number one, if when we come in prayer, we have to come with the right attitude. So that's where we're praying, Lord, cleanse my heart, sanctify my heart, help me to come before you in prayer to to seek you, to seek your hand of blessing with the right attitude. So take care of ourself and our attitude first so that we will show the right attitude, the right respect and gratitude for the opportunity to come before God. But another thing is a prayer of personal consecration. When it says, as Paul continued, he wrote, I exhort there for that first of all supplications, and prayers, the word prayers, the Greek word prosuch, literally means an exchange or a surrender and pictures a person who comes into the in intimate presence of God to consecrate himself as a first matter of priority. And so it's just one of those things that we do as a matter of priority. We come in a right attitude before God when we pray and we make sure that we are clean, that we are righteous as we approach God. And I know that that comes through Christ, not through our own works. And so we know these, we know these things. But Paul affirmed that our first responsibility as believers before we even utter a request or 
uh, a complaint regarding others before we utter anything else at all is to enter the presence of God and get our own attitudes and our thoughts right before him. Then with clear hearts, we can receive his thoughts and know his ways in the place of prayer. And so that's really what we want. We want to receive his thoughts. We want to know his ways in that place of prayer. And then we want to pray into that. We want to pray. We want to uh, dispatch angelic hosts. We want to pray with supernatural weapons to bring down the power of the enemy. So we need to begin to pray a prayer of intercession. It needs to be a prayer of intercession for others. And so when we come to pray, when we come to seek God, we're not just coming for our own needs, but we're coming to bring the needs of others in as well. It says the word of intercessions in the Greek, it says it means to appeal to God on behalf of someone else. So once we deal with our own attitude, we consecrate ourselves, then we begin to be in a position to bring others' needs. So the other three points, it says a prayer of thankfulness, that we need to come with thanksgiving. Giving of thanks. Giving of thanks, which is a form that depicts an overflowing grateful heart. Do you have an overflowing grateful heart for what God's given you and what he's blessed you with? That's the attitude. It says also a prayer for everyone. Now we're going to talk about a little while. (laughs) If we're going to pray for everyone, we're going to be there a while, you know. And so the the type of prayer that he's talking about, that that Paul is talking about here, is to, to spend some time praying and that that The word all in this, where it says, pray for all men, says we're not to show favoritism or to be picky about the people we pray for. So regardless of their spiritual status or political affiliation, we're to pray for all men. So we pray for everyone. We're praying for the kingdom to come into the lives of men. It says, this is a good test. Think about this. This is a good test because if there's someone you think you can't pray for, it probably indicates a problematic attitude inside of you that needs to be consecrated to God. This is very important to understand because your inability to pray for someone actually reveals a deep need for change in you. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Everybody, anybody ever been there? (laughs) It's like, Lord, I need need to pray for him. Um, Hang on. (laughs) <laughs> let, let, let me back up just a little bit <laughs> wait just a little bit lord okay let's let me have a preliminary moment of prayer before i get to back to that point now <laughs> you know even in the uh <clears throat> in the new testament where christ was talking and it's saying you know if you come to bring your offering and you you're you're coming you're you're on your way you're on your way to bring your offering. It's like, and then, but you have ought against someone in your heart. Oh, what do you do? It says, well, put on the brakes. That's it. Put on the brakes, back up, and go and give that. And, and make that right first, and then come. And so, praying for everyone. So, it challenges us because it makes us, it brings us, when we're sincere and when we're truly seeking God, it causes us to come into a right attitude. And then the last thing, it says, pray for government officials. We must pray for kings. If anyone needed a prayer, it was the unsaved kings who possessed lofty positions of power and authority in the first century A.D. And so we're back there again. There are those who are in authority who are godless and evil, and they need, they need to repent and get right with God, or they need to be taken out of their position. And so... I, you know, I, I'm sorry, I, I see it very black and white in that regard. <laughs> and so that's where I'm at today, you know, and, I, and, 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 you know, we need to pray, pray, pray for those that are, that are in authority, that have, occupy those positions. And so we're praying, Lord, cause a supernatural event and bring them to salvation or take them out of that office, take them out of that position, remove them and relieve them. And so... Um, if we had more time, we could have an uh, open discussion and get everyone's uh, thoughts concerning that. But that's where we're at on that, on that point. 
And now I want us to look again there at verse 5. For there's one God and one mediator, because God and the sons of men, the true man, Jesus, the anointed one. So here he's talking about the, the mediator, Jesus Christ. And so we've been given, in verse 7 he says, I've been given a divine call as an apostle to preach this revelation. Well, as the church and those who inherit this calling from Paul, now this, that's us. That's us. We've been giving this call. We've been given this call to continue to make this revelation known to the world that we now occupy. And so I want to encourage you, take up that call, whether it's a, through a prayer life, whether it's through testifying, whether it's through living the life. But let's determine we're going to be fierce for the kingdom, and we're not going to take a back seat in the, in the, in the circumstance and not testify or not tell people about Jesus because of the culture, okay? Because this culture needs Jesus more than ever. And so I think we need to continue to pray for boldness. Lord, give us a boldness to have such a joy, such an infectious joy that we're going to share the gospel wherever we go by the way we live, by the way we carry ourselves. Fill us up, Lord. And help us to fulfill that calling to take the gospel wherever we go. Now let's look at verse 9. It says, and then, and that the women would also pray with clean hearts, dressed appropriately and adorning, adorned modestly and sens- sensibly, not flaunting their wealth. Like I said, this was a, I felt like a very good uh, interpretation and so it's it's a, uh, a a word that we can get with uh, verse 10 but they should be recognized instead by their beautiful deeds of kindness suitable as one who worships God and so in a culture that so many times uh, puts women up in a you know what it would call I guess they would call a sexy fashion to you know, say, this is what a woman ought to look like. And we need to say, no, that's not what a woman looks, needs to look like. This is what a woman needs to look like. This, a godly woman, a godly uh, character, a godly attitude. Yes. Wow. Oh, it's 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 just like so it it'll break your heart to see some of these little girls. It's like why in the world would you teach your your three, four, five year old that? That that you know, it's like nothing, you know, grown well, okay. Thank you, dear. <laughs> That's the best way to let a woman to <laughs> address that. <clears throat> okay, I wanted to com- combine that um, with also in the message. Uh, it, it addresses this also, and I think that it put it in a, uh, in a good way. Uh, in verse 8, it says, So I desire all men to pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without anger and an argument. Verse 9, likewise, women are to adorn themselves in appropriate clothing with modesty and sound judgment, not in seductive hairstyles and gold or pearls or costly clothing, but what is suitable for clothing for women claiming godliness through good deeds. And so, you know, uh, specifically, we're not, uh, we're, we're addressing this is because this is what the word is saying that we're studying this week. So we're not, uh, jumping on anybody for anything. And so I, I say that because sometimes people will get offended. Did you hear what that preacher said? <laughs> said to me? <laughs> and so, listen, this is what the Word says. And so if the, if the Holy Spirit is talking to you, then you take it to heart. So uh, verse 11, let the women who are new converts be willing to learn with all submission to their leaders and not speak out of turn. 
I don't advocate the newly converted women be the teachers in the church, assuming authority over men, but to live in peace. Okay? And so I feel like that the way they word that is very appropriate because some translations are easy to misinterpret what it says in this particular scripture. And I feel like that through from the 19, say, 20s until, say, the 19... 70s there was some misinterpretation of these scriptures that was finagled i don't know how they got they got to it but that's how they did mhm mm yes Yes, that's right. And so that's, you know, Michelle was explaining that that was in the temple worship. They had the men on one side, the women on the, on the other side. And sometimes the woman would rise up and say, hey, honey, what did that mean? <laughs> in the middle of the service. And so it would be disruptive. And so that, as I mentioned earlier, Paul was dealing with cultural things during his time. Now, we still have cultural things in our time, and there's still things that need to be dealt with. But I'm here to say today that we are all created equal and women in the sight of God have the right and opportunity to learn the word, to receive the word, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to, be, to have all the gifts of the Spirit in operation in their life and to be used of God, whether it is a prophetess, which we see through the word, where it, whether it is a teacher. And so we want to encourage everyone men and women, to come to their full maturity in Christ and to become all that you can be in the kingdom. And so we don't want there to be any cloud on that whatsoever or misinterpretation. And so that's where I had said earlier that Paul was dealing with so many things culturally that so unless you have that context, as Michelle was mentioning, you may, you may be like, what in the world was he saying? You know, were they a bunch of chauvinists? Well, they probably were. Yeah. <laughs> Comparatively to the time they lived in to, and the time we live in, that's probably how they would be viewed as a bunch of chauvinist men who wanted to run everything. But that was the culture they lived in. And so we're not going to judge them harshly because guess what? They can look back at our culture and, whoa, there's so many things that just stand out in our culture that, oh, it's like, oh, Lord, we need revival. We need the Holy Spirit. We need a supernatural outpouring of God that will save this nation and save this world. Save the world. And so let's look at this last portion. And so this is what it says. And so love it. <laughs> um, I like the way that he did put that in verse 12. I don't advocate that the newly converted women be the teachers in the church. I don't either. I agree with Paul. <laughs> I don't, you know, new converts need to learn first and then take their position, okay, uh, whether it's a man or a woman. But verse uh, 13, for God formed Adam first, then Eve. Adam did not mislead Eve, but Eve misled him and violated the command of God. In verse 15, listen to this, you're saving grace here, ladies. Yet salvation will come through a child born by a woman. And women will be saved by that child if they continue in faith with love, holiness, and self-control. And so praise the Lord. Women, y'all brought about the Savior. I do like, the, uh, like that in this uh, other reading as well. It says, For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Also Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, she fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be sustained through childbearing, if they continue in faithfulness and love and holiness with sound judgment. And so, um, as I said, we're not going to be critical of Paul <laughs> because he brought us the word and he brought us the gospel. And he was dealing with his cultural things and we're dealing with ours. And so, uh, we look at that and see that he was bringing out the redemption that women were the ones who gave birth to a child who would save us all. And so, thank the Lord.
<laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Paul is also the one who said, you can be like me. You don't have to get married. <laughs> it's like, we, well, Paul, we want to be like you in some regards, but we're happily married, those who are married. And, now, and those, who are, those who are single and happy single said, amen, Paul. We know how you. <laughs> and so he speaks to us all. And so thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We pray that most of all, the overarching thing that we will see is that you love us, that you provide salvation for us, and we're so thankful that you also give us the, inner, the opportunity to interact with you in prayer, to bring our supplication, to bring our needs before you, and know that you hear us when we pray and you act on our behalf. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for Paul and the word that he brought, for the, for the example that he set of a man transformed who changed his world. Lord, help us to be in that mold, that we will be transformed fully and that the old man has passed away. That man we used to be has been passed away, that all things have become new and help us to go forward in the kingdom to become strong men, strong women, filled with the Holy Spirit, anointed by the Holy Spirit, operating in the gifts of the Spirit and fulfilling the kingdom. And so, Lord, we pray, cause us to be men and women who fulfill the kingdom in this age and in this hour and in this culture. We pray in Jesus' name, help us to live as overcomers. Amen. Amen. Amen.